Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing acetylcholinesterases and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So we've now discussed acetylcholinesterase enzymes. Uh, we've discussed myasthenia gravis, our clinical case where we really would like to be able to inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. Now let's discuss the drugs which actually do it. So, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, ACHE inhibitors. So, basically you can divide these drugs into three main classes. Okay, You can divide it into the ones which do not bind covalently, the non-covalent ones. So these bind to the acetylcholinesterase enzyme by non-covalent or ionic interactions generally. Okay, You can then have uh, well, actually, the second major class is then covalent, but we'll divide covalent into two separate classes. So we'll have covalent but reversible, okay? And we'll have covalent which is irreversible. So reversible, the body will eventually break the drug molecule off the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, and the acetylcholinesterase enzyme will then function again. Irreversible, the body has no way of breaking the drug off the enzyme, and the enzyme will become permanently inhibited. So, let's start with non-covalent inhibitors. So, the first non-covalent inhibitor I'm going to talk about is a drug known as edrophonium. Okay, and to explain what edrophonium is going to do, let me, ex let me draw my um, acetylcholinesterase active site out again. Okay, so here is our active site of the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. Now, the non-covalent enzyme, uh, the non-covalent inhibitors of this enzyme, are going to act on the anionic site. Basically, they're going to form ionic bonds with this glutamate uh, in position 334. Okay, so let me draw this. So remember, we had this glutamate. Whoops, glutamate at position. 334. And this had this carboxylic acid group here, which had lost its proton and therefore had a negative charge. And you remember that this was extremely important in bringing the acetylcholine into, um, into the active site of the enzyme. Then we also had this serine, which I've drawn awfully far over here, which was at position 203. Okay, so this is serine 203. Okay, and the functional group of the serine is this alcohol group here. Finally, we had histidine at position 447, which had this imidazole ring here. So let me draw this. So this was this uh, five-membered ring where um, two of the members are nitrogen and the other three are carbon. Okay, and here's the imi bond there. And then you have hydrogen off all of these atoms of the imidazole ring. Then you have a lone pair of electrons off this nitrogen here, and that functions as a um, center of negative charge here, okay? And just to remind you that you form a hydrogen bond between this partially positively charged hydrogen here and that center of negative charge, which is the lone pair of electrons. And that's because uh, the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen is extremely polar due to the uh, huge electronegativity of oxygen. Right, okay, so the non-covalent uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are going to bind to this glutamate here. So they're going to bind by ionic interactions to the glutamate at position 334. So these are the non-covalent inhibitors that will bind here. So edrophonium is, an, is a classical example of this, an archetypal example of this. They bind to the uh, negative charge of the glutamate. So they themselves will have a positive charge. And indeed, edrophonium does have a positive charge. So it has a positive charge. And it will bind to that negatively charged um, glutamate at position 334 in the anionic site. Now, if you have this molecule sitting in there, will the acetylcholine be able to come in? The answer is no. So the enzyme will not perform its function when it has the non-covalent inhibitor in. However, of course, this interaction is not particularly strong. It can break. So from time to time, the non-covalent inhibitor will fall out of the anionic site. 
okay? And then the enzyme will become functional again and might break down a bit of acetylcholine. So it's not going to completely stop the function of the enzyme permanently. Instead, it's just going to slow the function of the enzyme down by inhibiting it for the time whilst it's sat in there, basically. Okay, so edrophonium is an example of a drug uh, which does this. And it's used in the diagnosis of uh, myasthenia gravis. So it's not used for the actual treatment of myasthenia gravis. Instead, it's used for the diagnosis. So what you do is you give someone a small dose of edrophonium. Okay? If you suspect someone's got myasthenia gravis, you give them a dose of edrophonium. And uh, what then will happen is the edrophonium will uh, reduce the function of these acetylcholinesterase enzymes. So all of the acetylcholine uh, signals at the um, neuromuscular junctions will be bigger, so you will see a reduction in their muscle weakness. So they'll suddenly find that following this small dose of edrophonium, they'll be capable of contracting their muscles, stimulating that muscle contraction far more easily than they would prior to the drug administration. And that will confirm to you that the muscle weakness is caused by myasthenia gravis, rather than some more sinister, horrible disease. Okay, so edrophonium is used in the diagnosis for myasthenia gravis. If the patient gets slightly better upon it, then you know it's myasthenia gravis. Okay, two other non-covalent inhibitors are the drugs tacrine and also donezapil. Okay, so donezapil. I'm just going to check the spelling of this. Yes, it is donezapil. I remembered it correctly. Donezapil. Right, okay, so... These two drugs are not used to treat uh, myasthenia gravis either. Again, they come and bind in the anionic site of the active site of the uh, acetylcholinesterase enzyme, um, and they are not used to treat myasthenia gravis. What they're going to result in is increased uh, acetylcholine signals. So when you inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, you're going to get increased acetylcholine signals. But they're not used to treat myasthenia gravis. Instead, these two drugs are both used to treat Alzheimer's disease. So they're both used to treat Alzheimer's disease. And let me just briefly explain to you why they can be used to treat Alzheimer's disease. So basically, if we have a little brain at the bottom, okay, so here's our little brain, okay, then there are a few nuclei right at the base of the brain over here. And they're sort of like in the gap between the two uh, cerebral hemispheres. So if we were to look from the top, we'd see an image that looked like this. If we were to look at the brain from the top, we'd see the two hemispheres with the, um, the great um, crack in between the two, the great separation between the two. Okay, And um, if you were to go down and down and down into that sort of crevice between the two, right down here, then what you'd find is a bunch of nuclei known as the basal forebrain nuclei. So these are the basal forebrain nuclei. Okay, and these are a bunch of neurons uh, which release acetylcholine, basically. And their projections go all over the place. So if I colour these in blue, these basal forebrain nuclei will have neurons going all over the brain, basically. Okay, so they send their projections everywhere, basically. Okay, and they release acetylcholine onto other neurons within the brain, and that enhances their effects. Uh, well, it enhances the function of those other neurons. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, you start to get death of neurons. And one of the first areas to be affected is the basal forebrain nuclei. So these go, okay? So no more acetylcholine is released on, well, not no more, but less acetylcholine is being released onto the structures of the brain. And this is believed to underlie the drop in cognition that you see in Alzheimer's disease, at least initially. So you get memory and cognition going down when the acetylcholine released from these uh, basal forebrain nuclei neurons goes down. That's simplified, of course. The Later in Alzheimer's disease, of course, the drop in memory and cognition that you see is because the actual neurons all over the brain are dying. 
uh, but initially it's these that die first and that initial drop in memory and cognition that you see may well be due to the drop in the uh, function of these basal forebrain nuclei cells. So what we can then do is prescribe acetylcholinesterase inhibitors which will make the acetylcholine that the remaining basal forebrain nuclei uh, neurons are releasing greater basically. So uh, maybe we can restore the levels of acetylcholine stimulation on other neurons within the brain that is occurring by giving acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And these drugs do seem to produce an improvement in memory and cognition in people in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, now what we'll do in the next video is we'll move on to these covalent acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and these are used to treat uh, um, Mastinia gravis.